People leave church for a lot of different reasons, and over the years the reasons have become more and more complex as culture and society change. Let's look at a few of these reasons. They don't feel like the church is helping them grow in their faith. They don't feel engaged or challenged. They've been hurt deeply. They are going through major life changes. They find themselves deep in sin. They feel the church is not relevant. They feel the church is too rigid and judgmental. Now there is another reality that has brought on new concerns. There are multitudes of people who say they are done with church. But does that mean they are done with their faith? Can you simply be done with church? Does scripture address the problems we are encountering? Let's dive in and explore God's answers to these problems. Many of you already heard um, what's happened in Buffalo. This, this, this is awful what's taking place, and we've seen so much of this lately. Even locally, we've seen violence. It seems to, um, seems to, uh, it, it, to a certain degree, getting worse. Um, hatred is real. Racism is real. It's still a problem as long as there's a world filled with sin, there's going to continue to be a problem, but it just seems, seems to me that post-COVID, things have shifted, not for the better. And that disturbs me, because you would have thought everything we went through in the past couple of years would have changed people's hearts, perhaps, and see some transformation and perhaps even revival, but we have seen more evidence of the opposite of that. That being said, I, I just want to take a moment, let's just pray specifically for the people there in Buffalo, those that's affected by this tragedy and this hatred. Let's join our hearts together. Father, we just uh, come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord asking you, God, to be with those families who have recently lost loved ones in this awful, violent act. Lord, not only was a lot of innocent lives lost, there was also a retired officer who was killed as well. And, and God, there's, there's no telling how many people this has affected, how many churches this has affected, pastors right now that are ministering to families because of this awful act of violence. Father, we, we just pray that in the midst of this tragedy, God, that your hand will be seen at work. That your Holy Spirit will move and do what only you can do. God, bring comfort during this very painful time for all those affected. God, help us, Lord. I, I know, God, sometimes when we hear about things that are far off in another state, God, it's so easy to kind of disconnect ourselves. We don't want to even think about it. But God, if something like this happened close to home, how much it would disturb us even more. God, our hearts go out to all those affected by this awful war in Ukraine. I just pray, God, that you'll intervene. God, the thousands and thousands of not just soldiers' life that have been lost, God, but civilians, Lord. And I just pray, God, for mercy. I pray, God, for intervention. We know, God, that you tell us in your word that we will have wars and rumors of wars. And God, we are continuously reminded, reminded, Lord, of the problem of sin what it's brought to us. So God, in the midst of all this mess, I pray, God, that your church will rise up and be what you have called us to be. To love one another, to love those outside of us, Lord, to show them what it looks like to follow you. So many times we get it wrong. And we know that's why people walk away. Because the church sometimes gets it wrong. God, help us here at Bethel to get it right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a, 
testimonial I want to read to you um, that comes from a young person who who was really struggling with a lot of different issues, and but he was afraid to share those issues and struggles in the church. This is what he said. He said, quote, the hardest part is that I feel like I have to do all this searching and seeking alone. I have questions that I'm terrified to ask because I don't want to just be slapped over the head with a Bible and have various verses spewed at me. I can't speak for the rest of my generation, but when it comes to church, I just want to feel safe. It's not always about rebelling, and I wish older generations could recognize and understand that. Folks, ultimately, because people within the context of local church have missed the mark and the commands of Jesus from time to time. We see people struggling in the context of the church. And this shouldn't be a place where we feel afraid to share our struggles and our difficulties. We should have the freedom to ask questions, even if those questions are hard to take in. I believe this should be a place where people feel safe. Where people feel secure, where people feel like that they can be themselves and open up and allow God to speak into their life with love and understanding. Jesus said in Matthew 28, chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you, what? Rest. Jesus, this is Jesus' words. He says, come to me, all you that are weary and burdened, whatever you're burdened with, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're going through, come to me, Jesus says, and I'll give you rest. Jesus never approached any of the disciples and said, you need to work on this, Andrew. You need to work on this, Matthew. You need to work on this, Peter, before you come follow me. He didn't say that, did he? He said, just drop what you're doing. Come, follow me. Come, follow me. You're weary, you're burdened. Let me give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, over and over and over again, not only said words like this, but he demonstrated what it looked like. (laughs) Even the woman who's caught in adultery, all these guys are bringing this woman to Jesus and says she's guilty of adultery. They're picking up stones, waiting for the orders of Jesus, the rabbi. And Jesus says, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And all Jesus heard was thump, 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 thump. Nobody was willing to hurl a stone at her because Jesus saw right through their souls, saw their intent, saw their motivation, saw their hearts and says, if you're without sin, go ahead. And Jesus, the only one qualified, the only one sinless that could have actually did this, he could have actually had her put to death. He says, neither do I condemn you. He saw her heart. He saw she was repentant. He saw she wanted to change because he says, go and sin no more. I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to give you grace and love. And mercy. And God radically changed that lady's life because Jesus loved her where she was at. Over and over again, Jesus, people repented, people got right with God. I mean, Zacchaeus was one profound example of that. Matthew, others, they profoundly repented. Their lives changed. But not because Jesus was thumping the word at them, but because Jesus loved them. 
They knew they were wrong. Jesus didn't have to tell them. He just loved them. And they came to faith in Jesus because they saw the love and concern and gentleness and love that Jesus demonstrated. And Jesus is telling us all. He's telling people outside of us, come all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we see Jesus offers to the world salvation for anyone that will come. Whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. So He's inviting people to Himself and the church should always, always, always be about introducing people to Jesus. I'm afraid the church has been guilty of spending way too much time casting stones. Telling people, this is what you should do. And even Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 5, it is not our place to judge those outside the faith. It's not our place to do that. We're not called by God and asked of God and commissioned by God to take care of those problems with people's lives outside the faith. That's God's work, not our work. Our work is to share the good news and those within the faith love each other like we're supposed to love each other. Yes, sometimes hold each other accountable, which is the next text I want to read to you. But keep in mind, this Ephesians 4 passage I'm getting ready to read. This is so important. This text is written to insiders of the faith. It's written to people who have been a part of a church community, who are growing in their faith, who are learning from from God's Word. These are people who are professing to be followers of Jesus. It's important that you know that. Because sometimes we read texts like this and we try to impose texts like this onto the world. This text is not written to the world. It's written to you, the church, God's people. What does it say? Paul says in verse 17, he says, For I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity... They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they're full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught, taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former ways of life to do what? To put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to God, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Let that set in for a moment, my followers of Jesus. Do not let the sun go down angry. In other words, there has to be something that has to be dealt with (laughs) before you go to bed, right? And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with your own hands that they may have have something to share with those in need. In other words, work hard to produce so that you can bring something to those in need, he says. Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. This is to the church. Keep that in mind. Do not let, you're going to be around unwholesome talk all the time. But it's not to come from you. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, verse 30, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. There's a lot in this text. There's a couple truths I want to focus on this morning. Number one, a healthy church encourages you to abandon old habits. We don't slap, we're, we're not called to slap you in the face and say, turn or burn or get right with God or this is going to happen. God hasn't, he says, we are to encourage, to show people. Here's, here's the reason why we are to act the way we act and do what we do and say what we should say. This is why we do. We are to encourage in our preaching and our teaching and in any time that we, we know somebody personally, we are to encourage them to abandon old habits. But listen, this is so important. Even inside the church, this is so important. Even inside the church now, it is not your place to point people's faults if you don't have a personal close relationship with them. So Hilton, was that biblical? I think so because the Bible tells us as we're making disciples, we're building relationships. Relationships that last forever. So if I know, if I know there's an issue with someone that I don't know very well, I haven't earned an opportunity to be a voice in their life. Do you hear what I'm saying? Y'all hear what I'm saying? But if I have a relationship with you, and I know you, like I have a relationship with Josh, and I have a relationship with Adam, we're close enough that if we see something that isn't quite right, we can lovingly say, hey man, I, what's going on here? Brother, I love you, and I, I don't, are, are you Okay. Lovingly hope it. Even when, the, even when the time comes to hold each other accountable for whatever's going on, we, we, need to, we need to kind of help sometimes point people's blind spots out, right? We all have blind spots, right? We, all have to, we, we get so busy doing so many different things, sometimes we miss something. And if we have a brother or sister in Christ that really, we know, we know they care deeply for us, then we have an opportunity to say, look, look man, time out, what, what's going on here? That's hard, it's difficult, but it's, it's important that we do that. So, And this is what Paul, he's, Paul as a whole is encouraging the church. He said, listen, there's a few things I want you to do. I want you to abandon these habits of being angry all the time. Deal with that, that, with that anger. There are times it's okay and appropriate to be angry, but without sin. And don't go to bed angry. He's just pointing some things out. He says, Take, put away the old self. Put on the new self. He said that your, your habits are going to change. You're not going to be perfect by any means, but what you focus on, what's important to you is going to change. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So as you declare that you are in the faith, then there will be some life change. And it's not perfection. It's gradual. You continue to grow in your faith and you learn and you discover things and you're convicted of things. And, and you might be convicted of something, but your other brother and sister's not convicted of that yet. It's not your place to say, you should be convicted because I'm convicted. No, let the Holy Spirit deal with them about that. And then he says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. What is unwholesome talk? It's not just cuss words. It's criticism, destructive talk, discouraging talk, gossip, all those things, those things that are unwholesome, those things are not characteristic of a follower of Jesus Christ. He's telling us to be careful what comes out of our mouth. Because what could happen, verse 30, you can end up grieving the Holy Spirit of God and this will push people away. Listen. You'll be amazed how many people are not interested in church because they work with you or go to school with you. And they know you go to church, but they hear, 
things come out of your mouth that sounds inappropriate. You say, well, they're saying the same stuff. Yeah, they, those outside the faith, of course, you can't expect them to act any different. But if you say you're inside the faith and you're talking like they are, there's a problem. Don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Get rid of bitterness and rage and anger and slander and brawling and malice, all these forms of malice, and replace them with good things. And that's number two, and you know, it's a healthy church promotes new habits that build others up. He gives us a list to be kind, compassionate. Listen, in other words, be a champion. Yes, be a champion of truth. Avoid anger. Work honestly and hard with a generous heart. Make sure your words are not discouraging, but they are encouraging. And practice kindness, compassion, and forgiveness regularly. We're commissioned by God to build relationships. Not burn bridges. If you have a habit of burning bridges, then you're exercising. You're exercising the opposite of what a follower of Jesus Christ is supposed to be doing. It's all about kindness and compassion and forgiveness. The word forgiveness has been debated in so many different ways. Well, you know, I can forgive them, but I'm not going to forget. What? Yeah, I know the only person that can choose to really forget is God. But listen, it's amazing to me. I, I, I'm, still working, I'm still working on getting better at forgiveness. I am. But it's kind of funny. I can look back in the past and those people God's helped me to forgive. And it took some time is that to this day, I really can't remember the details, the exact details of why I got upset in the first place. You know why? Because I let it go. And when you let it go, you tend to kind of let it leak and let it forget. And it's interesting how that happens because God helps us to move forward when we forgive. If the issue is still an issue, you haven't truly completely forgiven. Did you hear what I'm saying? If the issue is still an issue in your heart and mind, it still comes up, you haven't forgiven. It took me a year to figure that out. A year. I have finally had a brother in Christ tell me, Robbie Dunn told me one day, he says, look, Pastor, I love you. You know I love you. He says, but until you get over what happened to you at the previous church, you're never going to be the pastor we need you to be. Ouch. And I was thinking, I said, well, what are you talking about? Because what I was doing is I kept from time to time bringing up what this person did to me. And I finally realized he's right. Praise God to this day, the person, not only was I able to forgive, but he's a good friend. It's amazing what God will do if we just learn this principle. Listen, I'm speaking to those inside the faith. We can't expect those outside the faith to exercise any of this. You know why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in them to help them with it. But we do. Stop using excuses and utilize the Holy Spirit that lives in you. Because that Holy Spirit will give you the ability to have compassion, to be kind, to let things go, to move forward, to be able to just simply let it. There is so much power in that. So practice kindness. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Because my point is this. If you can't get along with brothers and sisters in Christ, how in the world can you ever be utilized and effective in reaching people outside the faith? Because people outside the faith are going to be a little meaner than those outside the faith, inside the faith, right? 
They are. Because there's no spiritual discernment. Since there's no spiritual discernment, there's no filter. And when there's no filter, they're going to say hurtful things, and they're not going to care. They don't care if they hurt you or not. But it's those people that Jesus says, love them. Jesus says, you've heard it said. This is, this is his words, not mine. Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. That's easy. Jesus says, listen, uh, uh, if you're going to follow me, you've got to love your enemy. And do good to them that despitefully use you. Jesus said it. I didn't say it's easy, and I and I and I'm, I struggle with that too. But if I'm going to follow Jesus, I have to love people that don't love me back. In fact, I have to love people that want to hurt me, bring harm to me, and laugh when I mess up. Those are the people. And, and listen. As I said last week, what does that look like? That means I have to purpose the good of my enemy not expecting anything back from my enemy. Oh! Mm Mm-hmm. But think about this for a moment. What would it look like if the church did that? Do you know the early church did profoundly? And that's the reason why they were able to transform culture, transform culture. You think culture was bad right now? You know the kind of culture the Christians were up against in the early days? They were accused of being atheists. See, I said it right. They're accused Christians of being atheists because how dare they only worship one God? And the reason why Judaism got a pass more than Christianity is because Judaism was an ancient religion. Romans had a respect for ancient religion. So they didn't mess with Judaism. But here comes this new, this new thing. They called following Jesus, following the way is what they called it back then. It's those who follow the way, they're atheists. In other words, they, 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 don't know, they don't know that there's other gods to worship. So they called Christians Atheist. In fact, even the term Christian was an insult. This was a term not given, Christians didn't give them this term themselves. It, originally, when they used the term Christian, it was kind of an insult. It's like these little weird Christ followers, these little Christ, little Jesuses. You know, it was an insult. You don't believe it. Check out church history, it's there. But not only that, but listen, you know what the church did? In a culture like that, not only that, but this culture, this is how you think culture is bad today. Infanticide was legal back then. Did you know that? That parents had a right, if they wanted to, to take their children somewhere out in the wilderness and leave them because they cannot feed that many mouths. A lot of times it was girls. They would keep the boys and they would discard the girls. Infanticide was perfectly allowed in those days. We don't read much. You know why you don't read much about that? It's because leaders in those days don't talk about that. But culturally, this is what was happening in their culture. Infanticide. This was happening. You know what the church did? The church, a lot of people from the church went out and found those kids and took them in their own home. In those days... Greek and Roman culture, they would have adult men who have had young boy apprenticeships to have their sexual way with these young boys. That was socially acceptable back then. And you think, we're living in a mess. But you know what happened? The church started loving people. They started caring for people. They started being the hands and feet of Jesus. They followed Jesus the way Jesus did things. Jesus didn't come to overthrow the government, did he, when he first came? He came to love the world, and this this transformed people. And what happened over time, now church history is not perfect history, but what happened over time, because of the works of this early church, it transformed culture. Those, 
those things were, that were socially acceptable became against the law. Things change because people come to faith in Jesus. People became followers of Jesus. And it penetrated the world in those days. Great things happened. They didn't legislate it. They lived it. And this, these Christ followers became contagious. People saw them and said, oh, look how they love one another. Oh, look how they love people. They're not obligated to do that, but they're doing it anyway. Look what they're doing with no strings attached. The world was changed. I know some of y'all look at me, that really happened? Yeah, read it, it's there. Just, there's historians that documented this stuff. I'm not making it up. It, this happened. And God transformed people's lives and transformed culture because people came to, you know what the, you know what the secret was? People not only share the gospel, they actually live the gospel. We're commissioned to build relationships, to make connections that last forever. Listen, Christians need to stop spending so much time trying to get the world to act right. You cannot make a law and make people act right. The church needs to spend more time to become better followers of Christ themselves. That's what's going to make a difference. Not trying to make those who have no faith do what you want them to do. That's not our job, church. Our job is to become better followers of Christ and share Christ to the world. The mission is to make disciples and it's the gospel that transforms people, not rules. Rules does not transform. In fact, Paul says, when it comes to the law, it was our schoolmaster. The law basically defined what sin was. We look at the law and we see that we're all guilty of breaking the law. The law doesn't save only the gospel saves. Only Jesus can save. Only Jesus can transform people. And our job as a church is to get that message out, to let them know that, hey, God's grace is waiting for you to surrender. Just like his disciples, when he says, come follow me, he didn't say you got to do this first. He just says, come. And when you come, he started doing the transformation. He's the one that cleans us up. It's the love. It's the love that we have for one another that makes a difference to those outside the faith. He's wa the world is wa listen. The world don't have it together because they don't have Jesus. They don't have the Spirit of God living in them. The church shouldn't. It's not perfect. We're still sinners. But listen, the church should be demonstrating to those outside the faith what it looks like to follow Jesus and. And if we're really salt and light like we're supposed to be, like Jesus talked about, people will come to Jesus because they have seen Jesus in you. My heart's been heavy this week as I was going through this text I was thinking about this message today because there's been so many times in the past when I have made statements or even made posts that were somewhat political in nature. Because I do have a political opinion, but you have to pick and choose your audience. I said, God, forgive me for those times I have offended people outside the faith. And what I mean by offended, in other words, what I said was pushing them away from Jesus and not drawing them to Jesus. I had to think for a moment, think, you know, yeah, I, 
it's okay to have an opinion about what's going on, but listen, Jesus never took sides when He was here. But He was all about transforming lives. Think about Jesus. Look at the motley crew of disciples He come up with. He took a tax collector and put him with a zealot. I mean, you got one guy who's working for the government and another guy who despises the government. He brings them in and makes them disciples. Right? I mean, he took, he took some guys who normally would not be under the same, they wouldn't even be hanging out right along anything else. And Jesus took this crew of men and brought them together and made disciples out of them to make them focused on what really matters in life. And you know, all those men, they focused on the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. And they made disciples. And those disciples made disciples. And those disciples made disciples. And guess what happened? Over time, good things happened. And Jesus has been building His church for almost 2,000 years. He's still building his church as crazy and as weird as neurotic and strange as we get sometimes. He's still building us. And guess what? Listen, the, the, the devil is losing, I mean, winning some battles, but the battles that really matter is that the followers of Jesus are developing new followers of Jesus. But we can do a better job, can we not? Can't we do better than what we're doing? Absolutely. We can do a lot better. But we have to avoid those things in our lives that will push people away. If we're going to be salt and light, we're going to have to draw people to Jesus. And that happens when we love the way Jesus loves. <laughs> I think it was Andy Stanley pointed this out. I, I like this. He said, can you imagine what a disciples thought when they're sitting around the room? And he says, I have a new commandment. And they're like, a new commandment? A new commandment? Wait a minute, we got 613 of them. <laughs> a new one? Really, Jesus? And of course, then they had to think, well, wait a minute. He did condense all those 613 laws into two, where he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself. He condensed them all. And that into two new commandments. So they're still thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> Jesus, you really changed a whole lot of thinking here, and now you're presenting a new one? He says, Yeah, here's the new one. Love one another like I have loved you. And you know, we could read that and say, Yeah, that's nice. What is <laughs> but think about what how he loved them. Think about how he loved them. How did he love them? He took them out of their livelihood, no matter how shady it may have been, and he pulled them into himself, and he spent three years pouring himself into them, and he loved them. And he told Peter, he says, Peter, I, I love this. He says, Peter, you know, I've been praying for you because the enemy will love to sift you like wheat. And you know, he was just, you know, Peter was a mouthy man. Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, some of those guys were just, they're a little bit arrogant because they get mama to go ask Jesus, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? But can, my, can, my, can my sons be on your right and left? I mean, that, that's how immature they were. But Jesus loved them anyway, took them in. And what did he do? He's, he's, he's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's doing all these things. He's talking to the woman at the well, which... Culturally speaking, it was a no-no. He hung out with all the rowdy boys over at Matthew's house. I mean, he was doing all the things that the Pharisees would never do. And then that last night, he's with his disciples. Without saying a word, he takes on the role of a servant. And he washes their filthy, disgusting feet. Took them a moment. They didn't get it at first. Even Peter, bless his heart, he says, okay, why you had it? How about, you know, watch. <laughs> Jesus, and Peter, Peter just missed the whole point. And I love what Jesus said to Peter. He says, you know, 
you're already washed, but your feet need to hit, keep clean. What, he wasn't talking about physical. He says, you know, you're saved, you're set free, but sometimes you want your feet get dirty. In other words, if your feet get dirty, you can't be clean and you can't be effective. So you need to work on that on a daily basis, Peter. Confess your sins, then he's faithful and just forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, you know, he says that, that, that part you need to take care of on a regular basis. But listen, but Jesus is doing this. He's, 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 he's teaching truth. Not in your face, but he's just teaching profound truth. And there he is, washing their nasty feet, gets to the table. I don't know about you, but I'm not a foot person. I... <laughs> and it's hard, it was hard for me to think about eating after cleaning a bunch of feet, especially in those days, because in those days, they wore open sandals. They had dirt roads. They didn't have asphalt. They had dirt roads. And what they did back then, they would take these buckets that had human feces and they would throw it out the window on the streets. So you walk in that stuff. So keep in mind, nasty, filthy, disgusting, smelly feet. Jesus does that, then He eats. Wow. We did this one time in the Dominican Republic. It was on a mission trip. And we washed our feet. And I, I tell you, it's just a, it, was, it was so... It's so strange because some of the people came in wore flip flops, and we did this. And that night it didn't bother me. Usually feet bother me. It didn't bother me. I don't know why it was. It just didn't. And I remember this guy just crying because we were doing this. But I get to thinking about that, and Jesus did that. He ate with the disciples, spent time with the disciples, huh? and I just enjoyed every moment and. Jesus is trying to tell us there's something beautiful about serving others. And it's amazing how you can get past, really, you can, with the Holy Spirit of God, you can get past the weird thoughts you have if you're actually serving. I don't know about you, but it's easier for me, for example, we done, I'm just using this as an example because there's a lot of good examples, but I'm just using this real quick. When you're actually doing something for somebody else, to me, it's a lot more enjoyable than I do something for myself. What do I mean by that? I hate yard work. I hate yard work. I loathe hard work. Not hard work. Yard work. I don't loathe hard work. I really do work hard. Oh, man. Rewind. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I loathe yard work. I, I'm, just, I'm just not... I love to look at the effects of good yard work, because look, look at my neighbors, I mean, you talk about peer pressure, when they do a good job, you got to do a good job, right? But I do it, I don't enjoy it, but I do it. I can go to somebody else's and helping them out because they can't, and I, I'll enjoy that, I enjoy that. I, I went on, on uh, World Changers on a couple occasions, a roof in a house in 100 degree weather on top of a roof. I enjoyed it because when you were helping somebody, it was exhausting at the end of the day, but because I knew we were actually helping somebody, got to know the homeowner, loved on her. She was like a grandma. And just, you know, it was just so cool knowing that I'm actually, you just kind of like forget yourself when you're serving others. But when you're serving yourself, it's like, eh. You know? It's just not as fun when you're serving yourself. My point is this, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus says, love one another, love others like I have loved you. Which means, church, we need to step up and love our neighbors. Love our community. Do things for people around you not expecting something in return. And I tell you, God will bless that effort every single time. We've got to show the world what it looks like to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for Your precious Word. God, help us to be a spiritually healthy church. God, I know, Lord, sometimes we fall short in so many ways. I know, God, there's things that we, we do sometimes, Lord, that, and we say sometimes, Lord, it's not pleasing. So God, help us. Help us to recognize every day, every moment that we represent Your kingdom. 
God, help us to represent well. Help us to love people, Lord. Serve, step up, and do the hard stuff to make sure people know who we follow and why we follow You. God, I pray, help us to be salt and light. God, help us to be the kind of church that Salem, this valley needs. In Jesus' name, would you stand with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed, and every brother and sister in Christ praying. Listen, I want to actually just come down to the altar. You, you have somebody right now that you're still struggling with. This is what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to come to the altar and say, Lord, show me, show me how I can love that person that I'm having a hard time loving. God, help me. Help me, Lord. Show me how I can do that. And also, my brother and sister, I want to ask you to come and pray. Say, Lord, help me to be the kind of church member, the kind of person, kind of follower of Christ that draws people to Jesus, not pushes them away. God, help me not to do anything this week that will push somebody away, but God, help me do things this week that will draw people to you. Would you come? Would you pray with me for that? This altar's open. Come on, don't wait. Deacons, come on up. Make yourself available. Come and pray. Come on.